I'd now like to welcome Hilary Roberts onto the virtual stage. Uh, she is the former two-time uh, product, chief product officer, and she's got great experience across many, many sectors with both consumer and B2B focused products. She's going to be talking to us about pressing product questions, what other PMs and product leaders are asking right now, and how they're tackling them. Welcome, Hilary. Super, you guys, I'm so glad to be here with you today. Today, I wanna to ask you to join me in a conversation. And it's a conversation I've been having over uh, about the last 18 months or so. And it's a conversation I've been having with lots of different product managers and product leaders in different companies, in different countries around the world. And although I have this conversation in many different pieces, I call it a conversation because so many of the challenges raised by these product managers were the same. And so many questions that they talked about or had were overlapping. And so I wanna ask you to join me in that same conversation today. And what I hope you get out of it is, first of all, I just hope you identify with some of the other uh, product managers and the challenges that they're facing. I hope you find some camaraderie in that, that they share something with you. And um, I also really want more than anything, you to find something very practical to take away to your job tomorrow, Wednesday, next week. Because my talk today is not about principles or philosophy, it's very firmly about product management practice. So first, I just wanna introduce you to some of the other people in the conversation. And I've said here on the bottom of the slide, the names and the faces are changed, I've, uh, but everything else is real. So the, the people I talk about, the scenarios, the questions they asked, they're all from real conversations. And so one of the people I wanna introduce you to is Alistair. Um, Alistair is a product manager that I worked with uh, at, at one of my companies. And he was really, uh, I found him very smart, very dedicated, very customer orientated. Um, but one of the challenges he had was he'd only ever worked in startups. So only in really small organizations. And he was just super keen to get to senior product manager, but he hadn't seen many great examples of that. Um, and in his current company, also a startup, there was nobody really to model from. And another challenge Alistair had was he was struggling a little bit because the company he was in was really sales dominated. And um, what that meant was he didn't always find that they naturally took a very product driven approach. And so he was trying to figure out how do I drive my org to be more product driven? But also what does really good look like for me in my role right now, uh, given that this is the way my company is. Another product manager I was speaking with is Helen. And um, she was actually working in a really big organization known for their product culture. Uh, so very different from Alistair. She had lots of people she could model from. She was also a bit further in her career, so had seen more of product management. And one of her big challenges was she just wasn't getting a lot of great feedback. So even though there were lots of product managers and a really great uh, product culture in her company, the PMs ended up working a lot in silos. And so they just didn't actually spend a lot of time improving their own uh, practice. Another thing she was observing was, even though she was a bit more advanced in her career, she was spending more and more time on stakeholders and tickets. And this was raising some red flags for her because although it's super important, of course, to manage your stakeholders and to work really well with engineering, which includes of course, like writing some of the tickets or contributing to them, that's not all of what product management is. And so she was starting to feel um, these red flags, as I say, and wondering how do I do better in this company and how do I help them reach the next level uh, in product management? And someone else, just to give you a third example of the kind of people I talk to, someone else is Mario. So. Mario was one of the first uh, hires in a startup before they even knew what product was. And he grew with them into a product leadership role. It's a really inspiring uh, career trajectory. He had a real affinity for the customers. He worked really well with engineering. He read a lot and just drove his own career 
uh, into the product management track and then became the leader at this company. But he also knew he had some challenges. One was he only had experience in that in that one company, He'd never seen product or even um, uh, another like startup environment. And now he was trying to build a really great team, great product culture, hire great product people without having seen very much outside his company. And on top of that, he had pretty tough founder and startup dynamics. They were still a small company and they needed to move really quickly. And so he had some questions about how he best set up his team for success given those conditions. And the final person in a lot of the conversations, of course, was me. And um, Sebastian already introduced me. So I, I um, have been a chief product officer twice and a director of product at a large global um, company. And I've worked across both B2B enterprise and consumer products. And what it means is I've seen quite a diverse range of scale sector and uh, geographies. I've worked both in the UK and in Europe. And I've built and developed product teams and people. So a lot of the conversations that I draw from in this talk come from those teams that I've built myself. But a lot of them also come from my mentorship activities where I'm able to talk to many more product managers, even in companies that I haven't worked in and sectors I haven't worked in, really broadening that horizon. So that's the basis for the talk today. And with that introduction, I wanna take you straight into question time. And the question I chose to start with today is this one, how can I stop spending all my time on tickets and get buy-in to do discovery? And I was really surprised how often this came up and that's why I chose to start with it. It's so foundational and it comes up so often. And maybe you've already had this in your career or you, or you know what this looks like, but just to make it real for you, I'll, I'll give you an example of how that story tends to play out when I'm talking to a product manager. So they might say something like, oh, Hillary, here's the scenario. The head of CS, customer service, came up to me and said, I need this fixed yesterday. Two customers complained about it. Panic stations. And then the head of sales will come up to them later in the day and they say, hey, I already sold this feature to customers and I kind of told them it was live. Could we like launch it tomorrow? That would be great, thanks. And then the head of marketing might come up and say, I really need you to fix our tracking or the campaign is just not gonna work. P.S. is now a good time to tell you we launched the campaign yesterday, ah, urgent again. And then head of engineering might also come up and say, we just have to build this thing now or everything's gonna break. And then finally the founder or the CEO or some other very senior stakeholder might say, I've had a new idea. I already told investors we have it. So drop everything and build it. And in these situations, the PMs I'm talking to, they know they should be thinking about our customers. That's their immediate question. They say, like, I know I should do more discovery, but I just haven't got time because I have all these legitimately urgent, important requests. But the trouble is it's a real trap because what everybody else thinks when the product manager gets stuck in this trap, everybody else is thinking, well, it's a good thing I'm on top of what we need to build because product has not got a clue. And then they go off and marketing and CS and sales and engineering and the founder, they all think of more things to add to the roadmap and the PM gets stuck in this ticket grind. So when I talk to PMs about this problem, the first thing that I highlight is the question was wrong. So if you remember back, the question was, how do I get buy-in to do discovery? And that's asking for permission. And that's the wrong question. You can't ask for permission. You just need to do this. That's why I put the Nike logo here. This is just do it. Um, you need to make time in your calendar for discovery. But a second thing that I see product managers get stuck on is they, they just get stuck on what discovery is. And one PM I was speaking to said, I know I need to make time for discovery, but every time I try, I just get stuck because I think I just need to go like make half a day or three days to think about what our customers need and like Google on the internet and just come up with something brand new. And I don't think you need to do that for discovery. I think you can do this in one hour increments in your calendar that you block in advance. And that's why I call it bootstrap discovery here. And I'll show you some of my top things to do in both consumer and enterprise space. So first of all, if you're working for a consumer or maybe SME uh, company, 
customer feedback power hour. Your customers are already writing to you. They're writing into your help desk. They're contacting your customer service team. So the power hour is about block booking just an hour in your calendar to go through their verbatim feedback. Don't take your customer service team's word for what your product, sorry, what your customers want from your product. Um, and what you're looking to do here is go through their tickets in detail and either pick a topic if they're already categorized or just go back to the last week or two weeks or, or month worth of tickets and categorize it yourself so that you know what are the top drivers of customer feedback. Second thing on this list, this list is um, open customer interviews. And in a consumer space, even an SME space, it's just super easy to recruit customers to talk to you. You can do this in a few hours or certainly within a day, you can have a customer on the phone or in a Zoom call. And with these open interviews, what you wanna do is just ask them open questions. And there's loads on the internet about great questions to ask, but you wanna ask them about what they were using before they used your software, how often they use it, things like this. And the third thing I have here is job-based usability testing. And again, one hour, get a customer on the phone or a Zoom call and go through your core flows. It's always worth going through your core conversion funnel or your core acquisition funnel. Do it on different devices, do it with different types of customers, and you will always find new um, insights that will have impact on the bottom line quite quickly. And I have one more thing here, which is surveys, which I do not recommend in general for discovery, or at least not as a place to start, um, because they can be so influenced by how you write the question, who you recruit, how they interpret the question, et cetera. So if you're not already doing the three things above, start with those, don't start with surveys. If you're working in an enterprise space, here's the kind of things that I like to do. The first one is lurk. I just like to lurk on sales and client success calls. And what that means is just sitting with your video off, muted, and listen to the customers speak in their own words about what it is they want from your product or where it's not matching their expectations. And what you also get when you lurk on those calls is you hear how your sales team talks about the, the product and how they handle those objections from customers. And both can be sources of insight for you and the product team. You can also do that, of course, with the client success team if you're in an enterprise situation. What I like to do even better than that is if you have those calls recorded, just watch them in your own time, get some popcorn. And um, it can be even better because then you can take your time over it, get really great quotes. Um, and again, like just spend your own time rather than having to do it in real time as the call happens. And the final thing I have here is get an interview slot at one of those sales calls or customer success calls. And um, your sales and your customer success team, they always want to be showing to customers how forward thinking your company is, how you're moving quickly, how you're innovating. So usually they're quite receptive to having the product team join the calls, um, but you need to obviously talk to them in advance and maybe even work through a script with them. And the kind of thing I find this one really useful for is if you're looking ahead at your roadmap and you're saying, we think this is the kind of problem we're gonna do next, then go and find a couple of prospects or a couple of existing customers who your sales or customer service team think would be really good for you to talk to to better understand that problem. So this is how you can bootstrap to start, uh, discovery in one hour increments. And then just a note, if you happen to be a product leader, you have a job to do here too, to help your team spend more time on discovery. And the first thing is just, if you don't know already, audit your team's time. How much time are they spending on discovery versus other things? And um, then it's quite simple. You just identify a goal, take an action, rinse and repeat to try to improve the percentage of time they're spending on discovery. One example, um, a product manager I, or a product leader I talked to did this with her team and she found they were spending, going back to the question, almost all of their time writing tickets and so then she went and worked with the head of engineering to say, like, here's the problem we're having. And here's how I think if we changed our time, it would be better for us and for engineering and for customers. And they worked out a different part, a different process to free up more time for the product managers to spend on discovery. 
And the second thing you can do if you're the, the product leader is do some other structural improvements to make discovery easier. So build those bridges with sales and CS so that your PMs can join calls or embed that software to make it easier for your PMs to recruit customers for interviews or to watch sales recordings after the fact. And because it can be quite difficult to get um, you know, buy-in for a whole new piece of software or for you to join every single call, just always pitch it as a test. And if you get value from the first thing that you try, brilliant, you can extend it. And if you don't, then go try something else. So that's the first question. The second question that I hear super often is how should I respond to requests to just build blah? Just build a thing. And another way to think about this question is how do I get buy-in to spend time on validation? And validation different from discovery, right? Discovery is finding new problems to solve. And validation is figuring out whether the problems we found are valuable for the business and also for customers, and also whether the solution that we have is gonna work for customers. So how should I respond to requests to just build a thing? And um, again, to help you imagine it, here's the way this tends to come up with product managers. They say something like this, like the founder comes up to them or the CEO and they say, hey, just build this thing. And the product manager says, shouldn't I validate that? Like, that's what we do in product, right? And the founder says, uh-uh, that sounds slow. I want fast, fast is important. And the product manager says, well, pff, you're the boss. And they, and they are, to be honest. Um, and then what happens is some weeks later, the product manager comes back and they say, ta-da, I built the thing. And the founder or the CEO, they look at it and they go, that's not what I asked for. And the PM in their head is going, that's definitely what was asked for. And then, the, but the founder comes away saying, why is my team so slow and incompetent? They, they just don't get it. And not only that, they don't add value to the process. And this can be a really dangerous uh, cycle because it reduces buy-in not only for that person, but also for all of the product process. So let's imagine this story again differently, but I'm gonna embed the solution already and I call it the back brief. So imagine the founder comes up to the product manager again and says, just build this thing. That's the brief. And the reality here is we're not always gonna get really nice briefs from senior stakeholders. They're not always gonna tell us in a really nicely formatted way, the why behind the piece of work that they're requesting. Um, they're going to often request it as a feature instead of as a problem. And nevertheless, it's your job to figure out the why, to figure out the problem, et cetera. And you can do that with the back brief. So again, founder comes and says, just build this thing. But now imagine the product manager says, Okay, I've written a one pager summarizing what I think you asked for, why it's important, and what I need to make it happen fast. Also, I already had three conversations with customers about it, and I've tweaked the requirements in the doc according to their feedback. Can you let me know if I've missed anything? And what the founder comes away saying is like, oh, my PMs are awesome. They get it, they add value to the process, and they know what speed looks like. And that's super important and it builds this momentum behind you and your team. So here's my formula for a back brief. Um, and it comes from this book, I put it in the bottom corner there, The Art of Action. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can uh, build it, but this is my sort of starter formula and then you can customize it for your own circumstances. So first, restate the business goal. What are we trying to achieve? Why has the founder or CEO or other senior stakeholder requested this? And then you connect it to the customer problem you're gonna to solve to drive that goal. Say something about the time scale or appetite that you think the company has for this piece of work. And then put some kind of high level specific action plan in place. Um, like this is how we're going to approach this problem. We're gonna do this kind of validation work or we're gonna you know, start with this um, these use cases or whatever it is. Super importantly, ask already for what you're gonna need. 
And one example I have here is there was a, a PM I talked to and the founder came up to her and, um, and asked her to build an entirely new product proposition for their customers. And she recognized straight away that this is a pretty complex data product. Um, and she didn't have anybody in data on her team. But instead of highlighting that straight away, she went away for three weeks and then had a pretty disappointing conversation with the founder um, about how little progress they'd made because he didn't ask what she needed and she didn't say back. So that's why I put this really important point on the back brief, ask for what you need to get the job done. And then point six here, just sharpens everything else on the back brief. Say what you're gonna do, but also give some examples of what you're not gonna do. Um, so we're gonna solve for these use cases, but not those use cases. Or in this first instance, we're gonna go for this level of uh, quality or security or whatever, and we're not gonna bulletproof it or whatever it is. Two more critical things about the back brief to make it really effective. It needs to be as short as possible. And I put here a guideline, maximum 300 words. And the other thing is you need to turn it around in a day and ask for feedback. And that's just gonna show that you're somebody who gets it, um, that you know what speed looks like and um, it will get you the buy-in to continue the project on your own terms. Okay, next question. How do I manage all of my senior and quite often misaligned stakeholders without spending all my time on it? Um, I'm sure this comes up in your role. It just comes up a lot for different PMs. And I think it kind of, it can go away for a while and then it can surge up again that they end up spending a lot of time on stakeholders who just don't agree. And again, I'll give you a, an example of the kind of conversation I have with a product manager about something like this. So they'll say, this scenario is something like this. The head of customer service or sales or marketing or whatever came up to me and said, this thing is a really big problem. I think we should fix it. And the product manager might say, okay, I've seen the evidence. I understand why you're asking for it. It does look like a big deal. Let's do it. Let's fix it. And then sometime later, the head of some other department hears on the grapevine that they're working on that thing. And they say, why are you working on that? Who prioritized it? And what about the stuff that I asked for? And then the founder or the CEO also hears about it. And then they come up to the product manager and they say, hey, so-and-so told me you're working on this thing. I don't think that's important. Stop, work on the thing that I asked for. And then it goes around to different stakeholders and the PM ends up having all these one-to-one -one conversations. And the takeaway that everybody else has is, here goes the product team again, another secret prioritization decision. Product team just doesn't play ball. I'm gonna complain about this and make a really big fuss because I don't understand how stuff gets prioritized and I don't like the way the product team never uh, collaborates well with anybody. So again, let's imagine the scenario with a solution embedded and how it could go differently. So again, let's say we start with the head of some department saying, here's a thing, it's important. I think we should fix it. And the PM says, yes, that looks important. I'm gonna add it into my backlog and my roadmap. I think we need to do that urgently. But let's imagine they've got a weekly project review. And I say project review here, it could be a product review, but we're gonna talk about that on the next screen. Because usually as the, as the individual project manager, sorry, product manager, you don't always have the authority or ability to embed a product review for your whole company, but a project review you can do. So let's imagine you're the product manager and you've got this weekly project review and you invite all your key stakeholders to join you. And you say to them all at the same time, hey, the head of whatever raised this problem, we think it's pretty important and here's why. And here's what we've done so far and our next steps. And just for visibility, here's the impact on the other things on our list. And then what happens, because you have everybody in the room at once, is they either agree straight away and they say, that makes sense, here's my input, or they disagree, but they're able to then come to a decision quite quickly because they're all in the same room. And also what you get out of it is super important 
you get early input from all your senior stakeholders about what they think is important about this project, um, who they think you should talk to, any important constraints that they think you should adhere to. And so you can take all that input away and uh, improve your work with it. And the final thing is you can record those decisions and it helps you then maintain the continuity and um, prevent swerving or as erratic swerving uh, later down the line. Prioritization shifts, you can hold to the decisions you've made if you're able to record them a bit more structurally. So here's my formula for the project review. It probably should be weekly. In most companies, that's the right cadence to have real pace and speed. And the other thing that's really good about weekly is if your stakeholders know that there's a project review coming up, they don't need to fire stuff at you constantly. They can just wait for the next meeting. And another thing is you don't then have to wait and reschedule it because if it comes every week, if somebody misses one, it's fine. They just come to the next one the next week rather than constantly having to reschedule it. Of course, you invite all your key stakeholders. Um, and then the agenda, you want to focus on things that are already live where you need to make a decision. Like, do we roll this out to the next country or do we roll this out to further users? And then you want to work your way back to things that are about to go live and then things that are next on your roadmap. That's the like priority for your agenda. You want to focus on decisions and actions in this meeting. So it's a good place to get people up to speed, but really they should be reading something about the project in advance. And that's also why it's really important that before the meeting, you prep and share the agenda. And after the meeting, you record and share decisions and actions. This is what I was talking about before. If, you've, if you send out what the decisions were in this meeting, the next week, when the head of marketing says, I don't think that's important anymore, you can say, well, here's why we decided this was more important than the other things on our backlog last week. What's changed? And it just helps um, maintain uh, more continuity for you. Now, if you're the product lead, you can also help. So you can elevate this from individual project reviews to a single product review for your company that happens weekly. And why that's really valuable is so many of the key stakeholders are the same across big projects. And that reduces even further the communication overhead that your team has if they just have one meeting rather than lots of meetings for different projects. Okay, next question. How can I get better feedback? This also comes up loads from product managers and it can be, as I, as I showed you before, that they work in a small organization. So there just aren't a lot of people who do product who they can learn from. But it can also be that they work in a really big organization and they just work in kind of a siloed way. And maybe their manager just isn't great at giving them really good feedback. And I also love this question because it shows product managers thinking about how they can drive their own career, which I think is the best evidence that you are going to go really far. So I want to help you out. How can you get better feedback tomorrow? And the first thing is, if you are not already getting 360 feedback from um, other people in your company, then just go get it. Don't wait for your HR team or your boss to set this up for you. And what you wanna do is ask senior stakeholders from sales, marketing, customer service, engineering, et cetera, and the people you work with most, you wanna ask them to give you feedback on your work. And there's lots of different tools that will give you different formulas for the 360 feedback, but this is mine because you need this to be really simple really quick for people to answer. And you need it to be written in a way that they can be honest with you. And I've seen lots of examples where um, there are other versions of these questions and they fail one of those points. So these are my questions. The first one, over a specific time period, so the last you know, six weeks or three months or year or whatever, where have I particularly helped or impressed you? And give me an example. And this is how you identify your superpowers, what other people think you are really brilliant at. Second question, 
over the same time period, where did I disappoint you or miss the mark? And again, share some examples. Here is where you learn where um, people think you're not playing ball or you just don't understand the department or something else. And then the final question here is kind of optional, but um, it's really helpful for distilling down what is the one thing that they think you should focus on because in the first two questions you might get two or three points to think about and the third question is to help you hone in on what actually this person thinks is really important most important for you so if you could give me one piece of, of advice what would it be and just so you know i've it's, it's quite a simple survey you can take it from this slide but i've also created a template that you can use in the links on the bottom right So that helps you get better feedback from your peers and you can drive that cadence. But your boss is also pretty important for you to get feedback from. Um, and so here's how you can get better feedback from your boss tomorrow. First of all, suggest a template. If you haven't got one already that you use or you just don't find the one that they're using very helpful, suggest one that you think is better and I'm gonna show you one on the next slide. But what's important is your boss should say what's important they review your performance but you need to set your goals and you need to own the plan to achieve the goals and you should also drive the review cycles and this is another thing where you just put it in your calendar do this every six weeks right drive your own uh, feedback from your boss and here's the kind of template you can use this is the marty kagan one there are lots of other ones that float around but i use this as an example so if you were using this one there are lots of skills that marty kagan says um you know make for a really good manager get your pro your boss to rate how important are each one of these skills for my specific role and for my level associate product manager product manager senior product manager whatever and then and, and like make that numeric also and then get them to rate you for this period and then it should be really obvious where you need to focus and especially if they give you examples and what can be tempting here is to fight with the examples or to fight with the rating. That's not your job here. Your job here is to understand where your boss sees something different from what you see or to help raise your own awareness of gaps you have in your performance. And then what you do is you decide, well, where are you going to focus most in the next month, six weeks, et cetera, and how are you going to drive your progress on that goal? And of course, you can ask for something from your boss to help you do that training or feedback or uh, like on a specific thing that you're trying or something else. And again, I've got links in the bottom right here so that you can try this yourself with your boss. Okay, final question that I'm gonna take you through today. How can I get a seat at the decision-making table? It's a um, question I hear so often from product managers because they feel like they're at the end of like at the end of a conveyor belt where all the ideas start somewhere else and they slowly make their way to product and they just have to end up doing something that somebody else thought of. But another way to think about this question is also, how do I reach the next level in my career? And now that we've looked at all those other questions, this one's actually super easy to answer. So for you to level up in your career and get that more of that decision-making seat, First thing you need to do is stop spending all your time on tickets. Do that, start driving the roadmap by dedicating time to discovery and start with the bootstrap methods that we talked about before. You will not be an influential product leader if you are not driving the roadmap, if you're only focused on execution. So this is the first one, first important point. The second thing is, Avoid the just do X trap. We can't expect our senior leaders to always come to us with really great briefs, but you nevertheless need to nail execution and you can do that with a back brief. So it doesn't matter what the quality of the brief is that you receive, you can always nail execution. Thing three, spend better time with stakeholders and build really great relationships with people in other departments through a regular project or product review. And finally, make sure you're getting really great feedback in your organization and make sure that's your problem to get it. 
You can drive your own 360 feedback and your review cadence with your boss and the quality of the feedback that you get from them. And the last thing I want to say to you is just um, go smash it. Thanks very much for your time. And I'm really happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Hilary, for that great talk and that great insight into the conversations you've been having. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to go over to the Q&A tab and share any questions that you have for Hillary. Uh, we'd love to take some time to answer those and also go over to the polls tab and add any feedback there you have for Hillary and on how things are going. Uh, and while people add their question, I also wanted to show the gift we'll be sending Hillary uh, to thank her for the great talk today. Oh, thanks so much. So let's uh, switch over to the questions tab. A question from Nador Hargita. If the stakeholders are not trusting the product manager making decisions on their own, how will they trust them on the weekly review? Won't they just sit there and watch stakeholders decide above them? Yeah, so um, definitely can be a problem. I think the, the role you need to play in that session is make it really clear for everyone who is the decision maker for whatever is on the table. And it may be the case that you actually are not the decision maker. Maybe the decision maker is your head of product, or maybe the decision maker is in this particular case, the head of engineering or the founder or the CEO. So um, the job of the product review or the project review is not to make sure that you answer all the questions, but it's to make sure that decisions happen much faster and that you get better stakeholder alignment. And so, as I say, your job there is to make sure it's really clear to everyone who the decision maker is, um, not to be the decision maker in every case yourself. Brilliant if it's really obvious that you are the person who should make some of those calls. Thank you. Um, What's the biggest curveball to these suggestions which you've seen the pandemic and lockdown cause? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this. I think, um, I think there's a few things, well, there's a lot of things that are quite different, aren't there? But one of the things is um, people are getting even less feedback in a way because so many of their interactions are more one-to-one -one and invisible to their boss. And that's why the 360 feedback is maybe even more important now than it used to be, because you're gonna spend a lot of time doing work that your boss is not gonna see directly. That's one thing. Another thing is like this stakeholder management piece. It's a lot easier for rumors to start and for, you know, like Chinese whispers for, uh, different departments to get aggravated about something and you don't have that communal moment for people to come together and bring it together again. So I guess that's the other place where I see product teams spending a lot of time right now is trying to make that virtual space just as effective as maybe the in-person meeting that they used to have. But I think in both cases, you can compensate for it. You just need to observe what's happening and move your project meeting online, but make sure it's still synchronous if you can. And with feedback, uh, push harder into the 360 feedback if you know that your boss is not seeing so much of your work directly. And have you uh, observed any particular changes to the, um, to the review meeting and how that tends to be executed on by teams in the setup? I think, I see, I see teams going different directions. One is they push even more into documentation and like asking people to do a pre-read. Um, and that means that when they have the in-person or the you know, synchronous meeting, everybody's supposed to have done their homework in advance and you spend the time even more just on decisions and less on getting people up to speed. I also see teams going the other way and going, we spend a lot of our time alone. Let's extend the meeting to be even a bit longer so that we can spend a bit more time talking about why it's important and doing a bit more of a presentation about uh, why we chose this piece of work in the first place so that people get a bit more social time because it doesn't happen so much in the office anymore. 
Thanks for that. Uh, a question from Chilla here. If you set aside time for discovery, wouldn't that slow down progress? Are there any tricks or tips to achieve the best of both worlds ending? And part two, do you have any experience and you can, that you can share about this part? Yeah, sure. So I, I just think, first of all, it's a false choice between speed and discovery. So um, it can work for a short period of time to not do any discovery if you already know exactly what it is you want to execute. But when you finish that project, what are you building next and why? And what are your insights about that? If you haven't done discovery as you go, then you slow down tremendously when that project finishes because you haven't done the work to chart the next project and to get that one ready. So for me, you always have to do these two things in parallel. Um, I think what can be a real challenge is if you're in a company where they expect that product managers or product owners take on the entire burden of prepping the tickets and engineers basically don't touch them, then it can feel like it slows things down if product managers take time away from that. And if you're working in a company like that, then you need to either try, as I say, some of these bootstrap methods to just get a couple of hours in your diary each week, or you need to try to talk with engineering and figure out, is there a way we could do this differently? Because what I often find is engineers don't like that situation either, where product managers write all of the tickets because it takes engineers out of the creative process until the very end, right? They just receive really detailed specifications. And actually junior engineers or engineering managers could be playing a bit more of that role, writing a bit more of the requirements. And that's actually a, like a leadership and a creativity opportunity for them. And I'm curious if you have any, um, any experience with the pendulum sw swinging too far in the other direction. So you end up teams which spend a lot of time in the discovery and then struggle to get through to delivery and actually getting that value out to customers. Yeah, I think one thing I'm thinking about a lot at the moment that I don't have a great formula for yet. So I'm interested to talk to other people here if they do. But one thing I'm thinking about is um, it's super important that product teams focus on outcomes but if they just come to teams with outcomes, it's really hard for an engineering team to execute on that. And so how do we go from being outcome focused and focusing on the problem and having done all that great discovery, how do we move then really efficiently into a solution mode with our engineering teams? Um, and I, so I think that's the place where I've seen the pendulum swing too far is when product teams go too far towards only outcome. And then the engineers are going, well, okay, but what do we build? Or the designers even can go, well, what did I even design for? Because a problem is not enough for me to ship 